grab you apart and hang on and keep singing, all right? You are holy. You are mighty. You are worthy. Worthy of praise. I will follow. I will
blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Wonderful to see you and to hear you. I tell you, one of the most beautiful sounds in the whole world is hearing you sing a doxology. It's absolutely magnificent. Um, and I'm thankful uh, that you're here to worship. My favorite song to hear Marion play is The River. Doesn't she play magnificently on that song? She, she does all the time. Yeah, that's good. You can give her a round of applause. She's going to be... Uh, playing a special here for us uh, in just a moment. Also today, it's so exciting, back by popular demand. I'm not going to make any announcements right now, but there has really been just a grassroots uprising for Jason Bailey to come and do the announcement there at the end of service. So, I mean, we held out as long as we could, but we just can't. I mean, the, the tide is just so... Anyway, well, it's good uh, to be in the Lord's house. If you're a guest here today, we're really excited that you're here. We hope that you can just join right in and worship along with us. That is why we're here, to worship. We're here to worship because there is a God to worship and because this God that we worship is worthy of worship because He is good and He is great. He is good and He is great. The Bible says that God is holy. And by holy, the Bible means a couple of things. The first thing that it means is that God is great, that God is unlike anything else, that God is transcendent. That God is not one of the created things, that He is the Creator. And we all owe our existence to Him. God is holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And we can never forget that, that God is absolutely holy in every way. As the little children's prayer, when we eat, says God is great, God is good. That's the other aspect of God's holiness. God is also good, that his moral character is good. Everything that God is and everything that God does is absolutely good. And God has been good to us. The Bible says that the best thing God has ever done, the Father sent his Son, and the Son willingly and obediently laid down his life. The love of the Father and the Son by the power of the Spirit, God has loved us in this way. The Bible says that God has demonstrated His love to us. And how do we know that God loves us? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is the most amazing truth in the whole world. And that is the center of all being. That there is a God of self-giving love. That the center, listen, at the center of all things is not just pure, raw power. And whoever has the most power is going to be... No, the center of all things is... Self-giving love that lays down the power in order to save the sinful and the powerless. And that is absolutely mind-boggling. That that's, a, that's a center of all things. That's a center of our faith. And we're thankful for the Lord Jesus and our God who loves us this morning. All right, grab somebody's hand or put, put your hand on somebody's shoulder if there's somebody there close to you. And we always say the Lord's Prayer here together as we begin to worship. So let's uh, remember... Uh, Brother Kevin Black, his father Raymond passed away. His uh, uh, service will be Tuesday, so pray for the, the, uh, the Black family in these days as they remember Raymond's life and as they mourn and as they grieve, pray that God will give them grace and comfort. So remember them, all right? Let's pray together. Lord, we're thankful to be in your house, thankful for these precious people. I pray that every one of them, no matter who they are, would be reminded today because we need to be reminded that they are loved that to you they are lovable that they are worthy of your love from your perspective even though we feel unworthy sometimes Lord you know I can feel like why would you love me look at all that I've done look at all the foolish things I've done look at how many times I've fallen and failed but you love us 
you are our Abba, our Daddy, our Father, and we're thankful to be your children. It's the great privilege of our lives, not only to be your creation, but your children, your sons and daughters, heirs of the kingdom of God, whose sins are forgiven, who've been adopted, who've been brought out of darkness into light. And we know, Lord, that none of these things are because we're good, but it's because you're a good and gracious God. And I pray, Lord, that we would experience today your glory and your goodness and your love and your greatness, that you would draw us close to you because you are our Father, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. Brother Les is going to read from Psalm 8, a psalm of David, and we're going to continue to sing. Hear the word of the Lord. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you're mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hand. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And all the people said, Amen. Let's sing. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the
have a seat except for the little kids we say for little kids you young people heading to children's church head that away please thank you for singing with us
Thank you, Marion. It was wonderful. It is a gift that has been cultivated over the years to be able to lead us in worship that way. Thank you. You are a gift to us. Romans chapter 3, or chapter 1 through 3, but we'll be spending most of our time in chapter 1. Question of today we've been looking at for the last few weeks is, are homosexual relationships a sin before God or not? Pretty straightforward question. It's a question that our culture is asking, the church is asking, people answering in various ways. So here's the thing, I want you to pay attention very closely to me for just a second here. It's really important today that you listen to the whole message. Don't drift away toward the end. If you don't listen to the whole message, you won't get the whole message. And uh, that is especially important for today. We've been going back to the beginning, Genesis 1 to 11, to see what God's Word says about these hot button cultural issues that are really on everybody's minds these days in the news, social media, around the water cooler at work. This is the last message that I'm going to be preaching on homosexuality. I'll preach one on this subject that is associated with this. What about the transgender issue? Also, a big issue in our culture today. I don't particularly like addressing these sort of things. It's not enjoyable to me, but the Bible does have a lot to say in a very straightforward way about these things. And so it's important that we know what God's Word says about it. Romans chapter 1 is the fullest treatment of this issue. And it is consistent with what God's Word has to say about it everywhere else. The Old Testament, New Testament, everywhere else speaks in one voice on this question. But Romans 1 speaks to it most fully and most clearly. Now here's the thing, there have been challenges lately. Does Romans 1 really say what we have thought Romans 1 has to say about this question? And I'm going to address those challenges directly this morning. So these are the kinds of things you will hear as people try to argue. The Bible doesn't actually say homosexual relationships are sinful. It doesn't really say that. Well, let's look at the details again because that's not really what it says. And, but is it? This is really part two of a message that I began to preach last time I preached, which was two Sundays ago from Genesis chapter 3. Remember Adam and Eve and the tree, the forbidden fruit, and how they went beyond God's boundary and took the forbidden fruit and this part of that story where the serpent lies to Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve traded the truth of God for the serpent's deception. So what happened in that passage. In Romans 1, Paul has Genesis 1 through 3, especially on his mind, especially chapter 3. Paul is thinking about that as he writes Romans 1. And so as I read it in just a moment, I want you to listen for that. I want you to hear what we call echoes of the Old Testament in the writing of Paul. And I want you to take note of a couple of words from this passage. First, the word exchange. Underline that when you see it. And secondly, it's two words in English, one word in Greek, without excuse. So those two words are important today. Exchange, the idea of exchange, and this idea of being without excuse. Let's pray together and we'll read God's Word. Father in heaven, we're thankful for your truth and your grace and your wisdom and your love. We pray that you would help us as your word is open before us. Help us to submit meekly to the truth of your word as it's applied to our lives by the power of your spirit. Lord, you know how inadequate I am. Remembering Moses when he encountered you at the burning bush in his sense of inadequacy, we remember Paul crying out, who is sufficient for these things? You know that I am not, but I pray that your spirit would help me and give me a sharp mind, give me a clear voice, and give me especially a loving heart for these people and all who are listening as we try our best to preach your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, we'll read through verse 25. 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, all ungodliness and wickedness of men, who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation, since the creation of the world, His invisible nature, namely His eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. So, they are without excuse. They're without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God. They did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, actually they became fools. And they exchanged, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man or birds or animals or reptiles. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So here it is, the decision we all have to make. It's very simple. Are we going to honor God as God, or are we going to exchange the truth about God for a lie? Underline that phrase, as God. That's important. Verse 21. He could have just said, Honor God. But he says, honor God as God. So here's the temptation. The temptation is to worship God on my own terms. To worship the God that I create with my own hands. We all want to be able to say, I honor God. I worship God. Of course I worship God. But we also want to mold and shape God into a form that is comfortable to me. To conform God into the form that is comfortable to me so that then I can worship God. Well, God's word says this is what God is like. God has revealed himself to us in his word in ways that, you know, I'm really I'm not really comfortable with that. Honestly, there's some things that are kind of disturbing to me. I tell you what, let's, uh, let's take that image and let's just shave a little bit off here. And cut a little off this side over here. That's, that's looking a little better. A little here, a little there. We don't need this. Not really essential. Doesn't make sense to me, so it's not essential. Oh, that's better already. Let's squeeze a little bit of this into this mold so it fits like that. Good. Now, now I can bow down to this God that I've created out of my own imagination. That's the process that takes place. We don't worship God as God, but as we have made God. What Paul is describing in Romans 1 is this. I want you to come with me back into the Old Testament, back into the book of Exodus. In about chapter 30, 31, 32, you see the children of Israel at the bottom of the Mount Sinai. Of Mount Sinai. Moses has gone up on the mountain and here they are. At the, and he's gone for 40 days. What are we going to do? I want you to notice Exodus 32 verses 4 through 6. Notice the work of human hands that is emphasized here. What do they do? They gather up the gold and they make a golden calf. Notice it. And he received, Aaron received the gold at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. Notice the knife a moment ago. Fashioned it with a graving tool and made a molten calf. And they said, here they are. These are your gods. This is idolatry. Verse 6, then what? Then they rose early on the next day and they, and they worshipped. And then the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. This has connotations of orgiastic revelry here at the bottom of the mountain. Idolatry leads to immorality. They fashioned a God according to their own liking with their own hands. Then they worshipped the God that they had made by their hands. And then their hands were free to do whatever they wanted to do. You see how that works? How nice that is? They first exchanged the truth of God for a lie. That's idolatry. Then it led them to exchange the truth about morality and purity, which is 
immorality. Moses, before they went into the promised land, warned them of this. Don't do this again, he said. I want you to notice and hear echoes of Romans chapter 1 here. What Moses says to them, Beware lest you act corruptly by making a graven image for yourselves in the form of any figure, likeness of male or female, humans. The likeness or image of any beast that is on the earth. The likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air. The likeness of anything that creeps on the ground. The likeness of any fish that is in the water, under the earth. All these created things from humanity all the way to things that crawl on their bellies or in the sea. Romans chapter 1 verse 23. They exchanged the glory of God, the immortal God, for images resembling, resembling mortal man, birds, animals, reptiles. The same thing that they were warned of before going to the promised land. Paul says this is throughout the world still. Psalm 106, verse 19 and 20. Here, Romans 1. They made a calf in Horeb, Horeb in Sinai, the same place. Talking about at the bottom of the mountain. And worshipped a molten image. They exchanged the glory of God. You hear Paul? They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox. And the, psal the psalmist makes fun of it here. That eats grass. A grazing cow is what they worshipped. So again, they first exchanged the truth of God for a lie. That's idolatry, which led to exchanging purity for sinfulness. That's immorality. It always works in this way. All mora immorality begins with idolatry. It always starts with the first commandment. Failing to keep the first commandment, worshipping God as God. All sin begins with breaking the first commandment. Psalm 115 the psalmist says, our God is in the heavens. Our God does whatever he pleases. But he says, he looks around the world and he says, their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. And he describes these idols. They have mouths, but they can't speak. They have ears, but they can't hear. They have noses, but they can't smell. They have hands, but they can't feel. They have feet, but they don't walk. Now, verse 8, notice what he says in verse 8. Those who make them are like them. Here's the principle. We will become whatever we worship. Whatever it is that we've placed as God, we will, be, we will be made in the image of that thing. And the image of the true God in which we are made will be diminished and diminished and diminished and will be made more and more like the thing that we worship. So, when you lower your view of God, this is where Paul begins this passage, it's important foundational information. When we lower our view of God, we also lower our view of humanity. We're made in God's image. We lower this image. We lower the image of man as well. So if the God, listen, if the God you worship is, is a golden bull, why not behave like animals? People around Locust Grove know exactly what I mean. You see the connection there? We worship in a bull. We act like beasts. We know what bulls do. There's one bull out in the field there. The hundred cows. I don't know what the exact ratio is. Maybe Phil can fill me in here. Okay, what is that bull going to do out there? And even that's not enough. He tears down the fence to get to the field across the street. It's a beast. No self-control. Where's the image of God in this thing? They made a bull. They worshipped it. And then they act like animals. This is what Paul says. Boy, this works. But if your God is holy, immortal, invisible, holy, 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 eternal God, then your view of who we are, I'm made in His image, yes. We're made in His image. And it draws us, instead of making us become like the beast, it draws us heavenward. That's why Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, set your minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. This vision of the exalted Christ and His eternal God draws us heavenward, back into the image of the one who made us. Worship. Central to our ethical lives. Let's go back to the beginning. Adam and Eve. Listen to the lie of the serpent. He lied about God. God said this. He said, no, no, no. Yeah, that's not what's going to happen. Did God really say that? The truth is, if you disobey God, you'll be like God. Don't you want to be like God? Don't you want to exalt yourself and be like God? Yes, we do. And they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And Paul says, that's the same thing at work now. Verse 18. What do we do? What do we do because we want to sin? We suppress the truth. So push it down, suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Verse 18, verse 23, they exchange the glory of God, the immortal God, exchange that for images 
resembling mortal man, birds, animals, or reptiles. It's called idolatry. Where does all this begin? All immorality begins with idolatry. Not honoring God, underline this, as God, as God is. Not as I want Him to be, not as I imagine Him to be, but as His Word reveals Him to be. You say, well, okay, what is, what is the connection? I thought we were talking about homosexuality this morning. What's the connection? Well, here's the way this works. Paul says we dishonor God. We don't give God the honor that He is due. We exchange the truth of God for a lie and dishonor God. And as a result, verse 24, therefore God gives us over to exchange in our own lives, in our own bodies, good for evil with the dishonoring of our bodies. God says, verse 21, you dishonored me. Therefore, I'm going to let you go and allow you to dishonor yourselves. The human heart, according to John Calvin, is an idol-making factory. Constantly manufacturing things to worship. One author says, 84% of Americans believe. 84% of Americans believe. Enjoying yourself is the highest goal of life. Where's the idol there? It's me. Pleasure. 86% believe that to enjoy yourself, you must pursue the things that you desire most. I've told you this story many times. I was in here painting the ceiling one day. Three high school girls came in. They wanted us to buy an ad for the yearbook. And I always think this is an opportunity to share the gospel when someone comes into church, whether they're selling an ad for a yearbook or whatever they're doing. I think, well, they're here for a reason. So I began to talk to them. What's the meaning and purpose of life? These high school girls, this was years ago, said the purpose of life is to be happy. Well, what, if making, what if the thing that will make you happy is to, is to leave your husband and your children, or to leave your wife and your children behind? If that's the meaning and purpose of life, the thing you ought to do is leave them all behind to pursue happiness because that's the center of your life. This is what this is talking about. 91% affirm the statement, to find yourself, look within yourself. Anthropologist Paul Hebert sees a new dominant religion in the West in which self has become God. Paul said they, were, they worship man and all these other things. Man has become God, self has become God, and self-fulfillment is our salvation. Self-fulfillment is at the center, and when self-fulfillment is at the center, chaos inevitably comes. Verse 24, therefore God gave them up in the lust of their heart to impurity to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Underline that, among themselves. So Paul, Paul says the wrath of God is being poured out. You need to understand what, the, what the, the process is here though. What does the wrath of God look like? It looks like letting go. Zach, can you come up here buddy? Yeah, come on up here. This is, this is the image here. Okay, Zach, there's something over there that you should not, that, that is off limits for you, okay? But I know that you want it. This is the grace of God. I want you to go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Go. Okay? This is the grace of God. Is that the best you can do? No. This is the, res come on, go, go. <laughs> this is called grace. This is the restraining grace of God. But if Zach keeps pulling... God says, okay, if that's what you want, this is an act of judgment. This is what the wrath of God looks like. I'm going to let you go. <laughs> and that is exactly what we do. We run off into self-destruction. He turns them loose, says, if this is what you want, if you want to exchange my truth and dishonor me, if you want it that badly, I'm going to let go of you, and you can go dishonor yourself. The dishonoring of God leads to the dishonoring of ourselves, of our own will, of our own volition. This is what the wrath of God looks like. God lets us go to do what we want to do. And this is a form of judgment. Sin is its own punishment. Sin is its own punishment. Imagine, this is what this looks like, driving, driving down the road recklessly 100 miles an hour down a curvy road. Go ahead and go to that next slide there, Justin. Driving down a curvy road, 100 miles an hour. Now, you may get stopped. Maybe a police officer stops you and gives you a ticket. But there's not really a sort of an organic relationship between speeding and having to pay money. That's not a natural punishment for that transgression. A natural punishment would be you're speeding down the road, a curvy road, 100 miles an hour, and you crash. And you're paralyzed the rest of your life. 
That's what it is like. I've turned you loose. Okay, you can drive 100 miles an hour if you want to. I'm not going to hold you back anymore. This is what you want. I'm going to let you go. You've dishonored me. Now, go see how it works out, having things your own way. This is what the wrath of God looks like. Do what you want. Okay. God's judgment is letting us go to do what we want to do and to face the natural consequences. And this sin that Paul's about to describe, this is punishment itself. So Paul says that the first exchange, the first exchange, true God for false idols, is absurd. Why would you worship reptiles and birds and fish and oxen and elephants? Why would you worship fallen humanity when you can worship the Almighty God? This exchange, this first exchange, leads to the second exchange, which is also absurd. Why would you exchange natural sexual intercourse according to the creational design for unnatural homosexual intercourse. Why would you do that? It doesn't make any sense. When we dishonor God, God gives us over to dishonor ourselves. Our exchange naturally, one exchange naturally leads to the next. That's the logic of this passage, verse 26. For this reason, that is because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. What does that look like? The women exchanged natural relations for unnatural. The men likewise gave up natural relations for, with women. We're consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in their own persons the due penalty for their error. Michael Byrd describes this like this. Depriving God of His glory results in depraved desires. We need to understand something here. You say, well, I've seen this person. didn't look like this is the way that happened. Paul's not telling us the story of any one particular individual. That the story of their life looked exactly like this. They did this, worship, then did this. He's describing this as a big picture, telling the story of humanity. Even since the fall of Adam and Eve, this is what has happened to us as a race of people. We have exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and therefore we have fallen into immorality. This is what has happened. This is what has gone wrong. Now, so what does the Bible say here specifically about the sin of homosexual sex? Here I'm addressing mainly these objections. First of all, Paul says it's against what is natural. Second, he says it is mutual. And third, he says it's inexcusable. First, it's against what is natural. Now, some people will say, well, what he means by natural here is that what is according to your personal nature that if you are naturally oriented to be a heterosexual and you practice homosexuality, then you shouldn't do that because it's not according to your personal nature. If you prefer vanilla ice cream and you eat chocolate ice cream, you shouldn't do that. It's this kind of an idea, the nature of the person. Okay? So if someone has a homosexual orientation and they're and they force themselves or are forced into a heterosexual relationship, these people would say, no, you shouldn't do that. That's not according to your personal nature. Natural can mean something like that. Some people say, no, it's actually more about cultural. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says that it's unnatural, using the same word, for man to have long hair. But Samson had long hair. There's a Nazarite vow, so we know that having long hair isn't in and of itself sinful. But according to that culture... It's unnatural, and therefore men shouldn't do it. Men should look like men. According to that culture, women should look like women. So, so it's, it's a larger cultural thing, okay? But in our cultural day, we've come to understand, we know now that uh, homosexual orientation is by birth, and it's, so it's accepted by our culture, therefore it should be fine. But actually what Paul is talking about is not just personal or cultural. It's actually universal. For all times, all places, all people... This is a creational thing. What I want you to see in this passage is, I have mentioned this before, Paul is constantly bringing us back to Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. Paul grounds all of this in creation. He talks about God as a creator. He talks about us, us being made. He talks about the man and the fish and the birds and the creatures. There are 10 or 11 echoes of Genesis 1, 2, and 3 in this passage. Paul is clearly pointing us back time and time again to the creational, universal design of God from creation. One man, one woman, for life in a heterosexual, monogamous relationship. That is God's creational, universal design. 
Now, some people continue to push back and say, well, actually, Pastor, you know, the ancient world, those people back then, they, 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 they had no idea of a natural, innate inclination for same-sex attraction. They just didn't, they didn't, Paul could not have been talking about this. He could not have imagined two committed, monogamous, same-sex individuals loving one another in a marriage relationship. He could not be talking about that because that was beyond the scope of his understanding. We, underline this, know now that this is a thing. Only problem is that's absolutely not true. 400 years before Paul and Jesus, there was... In Plato's Symposium, he imagined Socrates having conversations with these people. There are lots of them, but one of the Symposia is called, he has a conversation with Aristophanes. This is going to be a funny picture on the screen, but this is called the Aristophanes myth. And Aristophanes is describing romantic love and how it came about. And he says that in the original creation, it, the, in Greek, it is the our original nature, our original nature, Physes, he uses the same word that Paul uses in our passage. Our original nature was that all people, now imagine this, it sounds crazy, every being was actually what we would think of as two beings stuck together. You see them there? Two heads, two sets of hands, two legs, two feet, genitalia, same thing. Everything doubled. Okay, And there were three kinds of those original beings. Man, man, woman, woman, man, woman. And they were terribly powerful and they were challenging the gods. They were strong and they were fast and the gods got sick of it. And so Zeus said, all right, in order to punish you, I'm going to chop you in half right down the middle and make two out of the one. And so he did. As with a string or fishing line, he cut them right down the middle and then scattered them all through the earth as an act of judgment. He said, if you don't start behaving, I'm going to do this again. You're going to have to hop around on one leg the rest of your life. And Aristophanes says, the reason by nature people are attracted to one another is because those two halves are trying to find their original other part of their body. This is according to nature. And Aristophanes has, has shown us three of these. Man, man, woman, woman. Man, woman. According to their nature, men are naturally, because of their creational design, attracted to men. This is 400 years before Paul. Nobody in the ancient world could have conceived of a natural orientation. This is exactly what Aristophanes is talking about four centuries before Paul. So here's the thing. It's absolutely not true to think that the ancient world, Paul and Jesus and the rest of the writers of scriptures or anybody else, we know that Philo of Alexandria a contemporary of the Apostle Paul, who died in about 50 A.D., he references the myth of Aristophanes. We know that they knew about this. Paul understood that there could be people who were born by nature in, with an orientation like this. Paul says about all of us, we are by nature children of wrath. We're by nature fallen. And so he says, verse 24, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. So it's not only by, it's not only natural, but it's also mutual. Let me go back for just a second. This is the line of thinking. This is the argument, essentially, for those who reject what Paul says here about nature. Something like this, if Jesus and Paul would have known what I know, then they would think what I think. They conform, Jesus and Paul would conform their thinking to my way of thinking. The first one is the Lord of all creation. The second is the apostle that was sent to carry out his mission, who wrote scripture, that these two, whose lives and thought, listen to me church, whose lives and thought have become the bedrock, the foundation of everything that's important to us. This idea of the equality of all people, this idea of the dignity of all people, this idea of the liberty of all people, where does that come from? It doesn't come from ancient Rome, it doesn't come from ancient Greece, it doesn't come from any other ancient source. It comes right from Christianity. Paul says, in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. We're all made in God's image. All of these things that are so important to us come from Jesus and Paul. However, if they had this new information... 
that I have. We've just discovered it. Eureka! About human nature and reality. They'd humble themselves before the weight of the facts that I have now recently received. Just recently. In the last five years. Or the last five months. Or the last five minutes. That I've come to possess. They'd modify their ideas here. Jesus had known the people that I know. He transformed his views on sexual ethics. Jesus, just, he was just in the dark, just in ignorance. That's the problem. I don't know about you, but that is absolutely, utterly astonishing to me to take such a point of view. Secondly, it's mutual. Some people argue that this passage, especially the men part, the reason it's wrong is that it's exploitative, that it's a master exploiting a slave, or it's a... a a client and a prostitution kind of thing, so on. It's this power imbalance that is wrong here that Paul is talking about. Well, it's clearly not. What Paul is describing is mutual and consensual. Notice the language of the text, verse 24. To the dishonoring of their bodies in our toys, among themselves. This is mutual language. It's even clear in verse 27. The men were consumed with passion for one another. No one's being forced to do anything. These are two men inflamed with passion for one another, for one another. And they involve themselves in this in a consenting way as free, moral, adult agents. It's mutual. And then third, it's inexcusable. When we commit idolatry, verse 20 and 21, we're without excuse. Why? Because it's plain. Look at what God has made. We know that there's an almighty, all-powerful, all-holy God because of what God has made. It's obvious. Just look at creation. Now, here's the logic. It's the same with homosexual sin. They're without excuse. Why? Because it's obvious. Just look at what has been made. Male and female fit together in a very obvious way. We don't need to get too graphic here, do we? In order to be able to procreate. Even if they can't procreate, it is still male and female complementary in this relationship. It's plain, it's clear, it's obvious. It's obvious not only in the world, but it's obvious in God's Word. The truth is that New Testament scholars, biblical scholars, they know. There are books written, I've read these books, that try to say, well, actually, this is not really what Paul is saying. He's not really saying all homosexual relationships, men and men and women and women, and all the other kind of stuff. He's not really... I want you to hear some scholars who actually come to terms with this. Pim Pronk, a lesbian, who has looked at all the data, and this is what she says. To sum it up, wherever homosexual intercourse is mentioned in Scripture, it is condemned. With reference to, the, to it, the New Testament adds no arguments to those of the old. Rejection is a foregone conclusion. Walter Wink, another biblical scholar, efforts to twist the text to mean what it clearly does not say are deplorable. Simply put, the Bible is negative towards same-sex behavior and there is no getting around it. Luke Timothy Johnson, a magnificent New Testament scholar, he says, the Bible nowhere speaks positively or even neutrally about same-sex love. The exegetical situation is straightforward. We know what the text says. I think it's important to state clearly that we do. In fact, we reject the straightforward commands of Scripture. We reject it and appeal instead to another authority when we declare that same-sex unions can be holy and good. And what exactly is that authority? Well, the authority that we embrace as we reject Scripture is the weight of our own experience and the experience of thousands of others. By doing so, we explicitly reject not only Scripture, but as well the premises of the scriptural statements condemning homosexuality. So what does he say here? My experience as evidently an omniscient almost being with the perfect capacities of discerning right and wrong, my own experience has led me to reject Scripture. Say, I don't trust this anymore. I'm going to say it's good and right and holy because I think it is. I've read several accounts, New Testament scholars, biblical scholars, theologians. David Gushy, whose textbook I used when I was in seminary, who just in the last few years has come out as affirming almost every time, this is the thing, Luke Timothy Johnson's daughter has come out as a lesbian. David Gushy's sister has come out as a lesbian. Almost every single time it's because someone in their family 
another uh, Brownson, his son, came out as a homosexual. He said, well, I went back, and because of my experience, I embrace it now, and I, and I, well, he actually tries to say that Scripture says that it's not wrong. But this is the choice. We're going to embrace Scripture or our experience. Verse 32 they not only do these things, look at verse 32. Though they know God's decree that those who do such things deserve to die, they don't only do them, but they approve. Underline that word, they approve of those who practice them. That word approve there is the same word that's used when they stoned Stephen to death. Remember in Acts chapter 7? And it says in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, that Saul approved of the stoning of Stephen. Same word there. So it's not just those who participate in these things, it's those who applaud it and say, this is wonderful, we should celebrate, we should march in parades and approve of it and say, this is great. So this is what has happened in our culture today. We used to talk about tolerate, okay? You should be tolerant, we should tolerate. But now it's no longer enough to tolerate. You must celebrate or you hate. You're a hater, you're a bigot. Simply to say it's a sin, not to get in anybody's way of doing whatever they want to do, but simply to say this is not God approved, that is bigotry and hatred. Well, that's not true. That is not true. Now, here's the last point. It's not only unnatural, mutual, inexcusable, most importantly to Paul, this kind of sin is not unusual. In fact, it's universal. It's universal. The title of this message is You Too. You Too. Verse 1, the next chapter, Paul says, Therefore, you have no excuse. Whoever you are, when you judge another, Go back a few verses in chapter 1 because he adds the rest of us in there. I'm going to read these verses. And just as he has pronounced judgment on homosexual sin, he says, they didn't see fit to acknowledge God. God gave them up, same word, to a base mind, to improper conduct. Well, who else is he talking about here that I can say amen about? All men of wickedness, evil, covetousness. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that one. Malice, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity, gossips, hmm. slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, that's on the list. Right next to all this other stuff that I've been so, I can say amen to that. Amos does the same thing in Amos chapter 1 and 2. He denounces Egypt. He denounces Syria. He denounces Damascus. He denounces everybody else. And all the Israelites gather around him. Amen, Amos, amen. And he says, for the sins of Israel, for the sins of Judah, you're not going to be forgiven. All of a sudden, nobody likes Amos anymore. This is what Paul does to us. He draws us in by setting before us this sin of homosexuality. And says, what do you think of that? Oh, bad. He says, you, you too. It's universal. If we have been sitting here this whole time condemning, 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 yes, preach it, brother, preach it, Paul says, wait a minute. Every single one of us is in the list too. We're no different. Therefore, you have no excuse. Trace that all the way back. I said, it's one word in Greek. Anapologitos. You have no excuse. When he was talking about all those other people, we have no excuse either. I have no excuse you have no excuse. We're sinners just like the rest of them. When we pass judgment on them, have I been judgmental this morning? Mm -hmm. I condemn myself. Because you, the judge, are doing the very same things. If I have felt self-righteous as I've read through this, mm, I'm in big trouble. I'm in big trouble. See, Paul has set this rhetorical trap and we fall into it every time. He lured us in by displaying a sin that for so many, oh, it's egregious, terrible, obvious. We're all saying amen. Then he gives us a list. I see my name on that list. He leans forward and he says to all of us, you are on the list too. Your name is on the list. 
You are also without excuse. Same word in verse 20. You're a sinner like everybody else. Richard Hayes says, for Paul, self-righteous judgment of homosexuality is just as sinful as the homosexual behavior itself. Hmm. That was a dirty trick, wasn't it? That's the shape of this text. This is what Paul intends to do, is to lure us all in to condemn all of us, including himself. He says in 1 Timothy 1.15, he said, I'm the chief of all sinners. I'm the worst sinners of all, he said. Now Paul moves forward from chapter 1. Chapter 3, verse 9 through 12, all men, both Jews and Greeks, are under the power of sin. As it's written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have gone wrong. No one does good, not even one. Is that clear? 3, 22 and 23, there is no distinction. Underline that. No distinction. He's talking about our sinfulness. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody is condemned by nature. The sin of Adam has echoed down through the halls of history and it has landed not only upon us but in us. We're by nature children of wrath. All of us. All of us. No distinction. Jew, Greek, whatever. We're all condemned under sin. But that word no distinction shows up at another place in Romans chapter 10. If you confess with your mouth, who? Everybody. That Jesus is Lord, that he's in charge, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Who? Anybody. For there is no distinction, verse 12. Same word that he uses in chapter 3 to condemn everyone. In chapter 10, no distinction. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. doesn't matter who you are. And everybody's got to call on the name of the Lord to be saved because you're all condemned under sin. Jesus is Lord, now to confess that Jesus is Lord is not just to say something. It is to pledge allegiance to Jesus. Jesus, what you say is right is right. What you say is wrong is wrong. What you say is true is true. What you say is false is false. You are my absolute Lord and authority. And I'm not going to pretend that I know better than you know. Because you're my Lord. Believe that God raised from the dead. Be saved. What about this end? doesn't matter. He's covered all of them. All of them. He's Lord over all, my sexuality, my money, my identity, my everything. Now here's where the rubber meets the road. And if you have questions, we're going to have just a minute for that. Two things I want us to consider. First of all, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Why has there been so much conflict? It, there has been so much conflict because from the world, from their perspective, what they... The attitude they've heard from us is that we've forgotten to read the rest of Romans chapter 1 into chapter 2. And that we're like the Pharisee, looking down our noses and pointing our fingers, saying, you are the dirty, bad sinners, not like us. The world does not need to hear us as Pharisees, but rather as the tax collector way back there in the back, pounding on his chest, saying, Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. Actually, the definite article is there in Luke, the sinner. He's not even aware of all the other sinners. He's only aware that I'm a sinner. He's not looking at the Pharisee, although the Pharisee is looking at him. Have mercy on me, the sinner. This is a sin. Righteous, self-righteous judgment is, is a greater sin than the sins of the flesh. Homosexual behavior, whatever it might be. Okay? So let us, first of all, let us be the meek and humble sinner tax collector as we deal with the world. Okay? Not the self-righteous Pharisee. Secondly, we also have to have the resolve and courage of Peter and John. In Acts chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, in the face of fierce opposition, when they were telling them, shut your mouth, quit telling the truth, you're going to get thrown in jail, you're going to suffer for this. As we experience the pressure of our culture to melt in fear and to wilt in fear, we have to say, I'm the, I'm the chief of all sinners. I'm the worst of all. I'm way worse than you. How do I know that? Because I know me. But I have to tell the truth. I can't lie. That is not a loving thing to do. We must obey God rather than men, come what may. The world needs us to be salt, which preserves culture and light, which reveals the truth. Are we going to honor God as God? Or are we going to exchange the truth about God for a lie.
That's the question we must all face. Okay. Any question? I know that's a lot, but there's a lot there. And yes, Jason. Approving would be. Yeah. This isn't always possible. Um, most of the time it is. Uh, there's this idea that you have to earn the right to, to speak very directly and have these kind of conversations. Establishing a relationship with, with whoever it might be. And this isn't just for this kind of sin. This is whatever, you know. So that they, I've laid down my life for this person. I love them. They know that I accept them as a, as a person, as a human being. Someone made in God's image, loved by God. And so that's the best case scenario to sort of earn the right to speak the truth because a friendship has been established. I don't, I don't, I can't negotiate on what is true and what is false. But the, the big idea there that I was talking about is this has been the huge problem. Even when we do it perfectly in terms of our attitude, it can, it can still go south, okay? But it is this self righteous, judgmental attitude is the thing that drives people away. So I've got to approve but to say this is a good and beautiful and true and right thing. Okay, I can't do that. But hey, come to my house and have dinner. I'm going to embrace you. When you fall down, I'm going to help you up. I'm going to love you in every way. One of the ways that I love you is to speak the truth to you. And it's not a perfect process. Um, it, does, that, does that answer your question? I mean, this is... Is that close? Yeah. It's difficult, but there has to be a relationship of love established there if, if we're going to really make a difference and not push people away instead. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, Romans chapter 5, Paul says in, in, in Adam, we're all fallen. He goes back to the Genesis story. And he says, look at what happened. Look at what happened when Adam and Eve took the fruit. There's one son killed another, and it just goes south from there, and it has infected everybody. We are all born fallen. Okay, Our fallen nature manifests itself in different ways. Not everybody has the exact same temptation. I am just as fallen as anybody else, my fallenness may look a little different than yours. Some people are predisposed to alcoholism and getting drunk. They take a drink and that's it. I don't have that problem. But my, my, my sinfulness is just, as sinfulness is just as sinful as anybody else's, but it manifests itself differently. Yes, God is our creator, but we are born into a fallen world born to fallen parents. And so that is the big thing. That's one of the big things that Paul is doing here is saying, look, this group of people are no more fallen, no more sinful than anybody else. They are fallen. They are sinful. We are all by nature, by nature, children of wrath and stand condemned. That's the reason for Jesus coming to die for our sins. Um, but I, just because I have a nature for something does not mean it's good, Right? I mean, we see that physically, spiritually, emotionally, we're broken and fallen in lots and lots of ways. This is just one of those manifestations. That's why Jesus says you have to take up your cross every day. Why? Well, because I have this nature, this old man, this old Adam that is clinging to me and won't be completely disposed of until the resurrection comes. And I'm going to have to fight. This is one of those things. To take up your cross, what does that mean, church? Where are you going if you take up a cross? You're going to die. That is the call of discipleship. Bonhoeffer said, when Jesus calls a man, he only calls him to come and die. So creation, yes, 
but born into a fallen world, conceived in a fallen world. David says in Psalm 51, I was conceived in sin from my mother's womb. This is just one manifestation of our, of our fallen nature. That's what Jesus has come to do. The kingdom is spreading and all creation is being redeemed and fixed. The kingdom of God is growing, but it's not going to be perfect until that final day comes. Yes, Paul. Yeah, that's a complicated question uh, because here, here's the thing. This could be a little bit controversial. Do I think that someone with a homosexual orientation that isn't a same-sex attraction that is still there and every single day they're fighting, taking up their cross and following after him, can they be, in, can they be a pastor? Yes. Just like a man who, when he sees other women besides his wife, is a natural attraction. If he were to act on that, well, that would be adultery, wouldn't it? Is he allowed to be in church leadership? Well, yes. Because there's nobody except those kind of people available for church leadership. People who are fallen and who are tempted. So that's, so that's one category of persons. Okay, If it's someone who says, that homosexual lifestyle or swingers, adulterous lifestyle, whatever it might be, it's not just something I, it's not something I struggle with, it's something I celebrate and endorse and think it is a good and wonderful thing, then obviously th that person could not be in church leadership because this is approving and celebrating and actively living a lifestyle, not carrying across and fighting against it, but embracing it as a good, what God has called bad, embracing it as good. So that's the way it's a complicated question those are two different, very, very distinct situations. Um, the, the other part of that is, um, I, would, I would want, now you said someone asked you the question. For the most part, I would probably just, what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, mind my own business. Um, I don't want to wade into other people's situations and start pontificating. And that doesn't sound at all like what you're talking about. Someone asks you, why, why don't you? That, you know, that, that's what I would say because the Bible says, these are the qualifications, and you can't reject the Word of God and preach the Word of God. Does that make sense, Brother Paul? You need clarification? I know, I know we're in a, an unusual context here, but... Yeah, well, I... I Right. First Corinthians chapter five. Right. Yeah. I mean, I would draw the line of morality where you know where the Bible draws it and says this is this you know this Bible says this is good, this is bad, and you know, are are there places where there's a difference of interpretation like tithing or you know, I don't believe in tithing. I do believe in tithing. Well, I no, I, I think there's gray area there, but this is, this is not one of those areas that's a gray area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in that situation, there was a man who was uh, sleeping with his father's wife, and it's interesting because the church was approving of it. Paul said that you're boasting about it. The Corinthians believed that they were you know, super spiritual and we're showing ex extreme grace by em embracing a man sleeping with his father's wife. And Paul said, he's unrepentant. This has so infected the church body. But you've approved it. He's unrepentant. You have to remove him from the church body and because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. This is spreading throughout the congregation because you're approving of it and you're allowing it to go on and, and you're boasting about it and celebrating it. So they, their church discipline had to take place. Now, he said, deliver him over to Satan that, you know, that his flesh may be saved. I want this person to be saved, but you've got to kick him out of the church. Now, in this day and time, in Corinth, there was just the Christian church of Corinth. Today, you kick him out of the church, and they, you know, there's a church in every block, so they can you know, just pick another one. But, um, so, yeah, so there, that's a place where there was, un, there was a lack of repentance, 
it was corrupting a congregation. And so that's, those are the measures that they were not punitive. They were redemptive. It wasn't to punish this person, but rather that he might be finally restored as a result of being cut off from not only a church, but his social group, which would have been really important in, in, in that time. Those are, those are still in place, yes. You don't see this kind of thing very often, but yeah. And there's an ostentatious display of immorality that is celebrated and spreading. Then yeah, I mean, um, th- th- those kind of things need to be taken care of. Yeah. For the sake of the person and for the body. Yes, Sister Linda. That's a, yeah. So the question is, sorry, I, for the people at home, I haven't been repeating the questions. I forgot to do that. Uh, the question is, what about where we spend our money? Businesses that support certain things. Here's the thing. That's a gray area, but I don't really want to get into that. You know, um, I, I'm not going to, it's kind of like food sacrifice to idols. Don't ask. Just, just. Just go eat your dinner and don't ask too many questions. And um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm not encouraging encouraging anyone, you know, to go to the strip joint between here and uh, Inola. <laughs> don't ask questions. But, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I would say, look, let's, let's show absolutely as much grace as we possibly can. Am I too holy to go into a place that I know that the person, uh, you know, lives this kind of lifestyle, or supports this kind of lifestyle, a sticker on the window, whatever it might be. Uh, no, I, I, yeah, unless it's coming to my table in my face saying, unless you agree with this, we're kicking you out of here, then I'm going to, I'm just going to go about my life and shop and eat and whatever. Yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not too righteous. I'm not too holy to go somewhere and eat a hamburger. You know, sure. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, again, that's a gray area. Paul says in chapter four, Romans 14, whatever is not from faith is sin. So if your conscience condemns you, your own conscience, then, then you shouldn't go because you're sinning against your own conscience. He's talking there again about food sacrifice to idols. If, you're, if your conscience says it's nothing, there's no, there's no such thing as an idol. It's, it's just a piece of material. It doesn't condemn you, then go in. If it does condemn you, then don't go in. But if you have a brother that's going to make him fall, if you go in, then don't go in. Now, that's a, that's a whole other sermon, but, but, that's the, but that's the idea. But that, these are the kind of ad hoc, concrete situations that we all face. And you've got to make the best decision that you can. And be humble and full of grace and love, most of all. If you're going to err on a side, that's the place to, that's the way to err. All right, let's pray. If you have other questions, you feel free to come uh, ask me after church. Let's pray together. Then Jason's going to come, uh, give us our announcements, and we'll receive the blessing. Father in heaven, have mercy on us because we are the sinners. We have no ground to stand upon from which we might judge others and condemn others. Lord, we also have received your word, which is truth. Help us to do our best to understand it and to live it. And when we have an opportunity to share it, let us always speak the truth in love. With courage, knowing that sometimes 
We're going to be opposed. Sometimes people are going to hate us for standing on the truth of your word, even with, with much meekness and humility. But Lord, help us to be faithful. Give us wisdom to deal as we go through life with these complicated situations. Most of all, Lord, we pray that from us no one would ever get the sense that we think that we are better or more righteous or more holy or more deserving, that they're beneath us or below us. Lord, may that never happen and forgive us where it has. Help us to be salt and light in this world, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you all ready for this? Yeah, yeah, a lot of pressure. All right. You guys ready for some announcements? You guys awake over here? You guys awake? All right. Well, when, I, when Jeff called me dozens of times begging for me to come back to do announcements, I thought he might throw me a softball and preach about, like, Jesus and babies or something, but <laughs> nope, got to go after that. All right, here we go. BBS is coming up June 6th through the 10th. Here we go. Here's some great BBS stuff. You register online on Facebook. Everybody know what Facebook is? You go there and you register for BBS. There are CDs in Penny's desk, uh, and mints, I've heard, uh, for the VBS music. One family, uh, one for uh, each family register. There's their music on VBS. You want to go back there. Let's have somebody kind of orchestrate that so we're not digging through Penny's desk, all right? But uh, go back, get your CD. You guys can practice to it. And again, that's uh, June 6th through the 10th. Uh, and then, of course, we need volunteers for VBS. If you've never volunteered, it's an amazing, for some of you, one-time experience, <laughs> right? One time in, and you have been uh, accepting of all that. So there, there's that. So, uh, but we need volunteers. We need volunteers for people who are going to travel with the age groups between uh, the different um, activities. You know, there's different activities going on in the church, and, and when the age groups, when, the, when they move between, we get some runners from time to time, and we got to make sure that we... Uh, that we have uh, people kind of making sure they're all staying in line. So that's exciting. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Kids Camp is July 11th through the 14th, uh, and that cost is $180 per person. The official registration will be sent out uh, the first week of June. Uh, camp is for completed grades second through sixth grade. So if you just completed second through sixth grade uh, like three days ago, then you can go to kids' camp. And then, of course, uh, Free Will Baptist National Convention is the 18th through the 21st in Memphis, Tennessee. Mm. So that's exciting. You guys going to Graceland? Is that, is that, are they having it in Graceland? Elvis theme this year, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> okay, Jenny has an announcement to make as well. Sorry, I didn't get mine to Jason in time. Um, so back a few months ago, our Daxton Shatswell got married um, to a sweet little girl. What? Oh, it was a Today? year ago. It was more than a wow. few months ago. It was back during COVID restriction time. So we were not able to celebrate with them and bless them with a shower. And so now that things have kind of lifted, um, we want to do that for them. The problem is they work at a church in Kansas and um, very rarely are they able to get free on a Sunday or a weekend to be here with us, but they're going to be here next weekend. So we are going to celebrate with them. So what we are going to do, it's, it's been an unconventional year, so we're going to do it in an unconventional way. We're going to have a table set up in the lobby next Sunday morning. We will have goodies for you. If they will be there, you can come by, hug them, congratulate them on their one-year anniversary, <laughs> and um, give them, um, you can drop a check-in, a gift card, buy a gift, um, just something to know that we love them. We're so proud of him. He's gone here his entire life, and, um, and we want to be a blessing to them. So... Next Sunday morning, you can do it um, in between uh, Sunday school and service or directly after the service is over. They'll be out there for you to go by and hug them. Thank you. Well done, Jason and Jenny. Uh, one last thing. Go ahead and stand. That's the cost for camp. If, if you have a, a child, a grandchild, whatever, that wants to go to camp and the 160, whatever it is, is cost prohibitive, we want them to go. We will, we will take care of their fee for going to camp, okay? So anybody who wants to go can go. Uh, so, all right. Remember that you are the light of the world and that a city that is set upon a hill cannot be hidden.
Therefore, let your light so shine before all men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine down upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. You're dismissed.